Um, so hello everyone. Welcome to the 2022 Long Island Coastal BioBlitz training. We are so excited to have you joining us tonight. My name is Ariel Santos and I'm a conservation scientist for CTUC and I will be moderating today's webinar. The goal for today's presentation is to share this exciting event with you all and to act as a training workshop to explain what a BioBlitz is, how to join the Long Island Coastal BioBlitz, and what's involved in participating in an event such as this. So I just wanted to go over some housekeeping rules uh, before we begin. This webinar is being recorded, and the recording will be available on CTUC's website shortly after the webinar concludes. Your video and microphones are turned off, but you are free to ask questions in the Q&A section at the bottom of your screen. If you don't have a question, but want to share a resource or discuss something amongst the group, you're more than welcome to use that chat box. So with that, we can hop right into the presentation. So to kick things off, we're going to have you answer this first poll, which asks, have you ever heard of a BioBlitz before? So I'm gonna go ahead and launch this first poll here. And all of the questions that you answer, they're anonymous, so don't worry about it. Awesome. So there's yes or no. And it looks like most people haven't heard of a BioBlitz before, or now it's 50-50. Okay, this is great. So some of you, this will be a little repeat or refresher of some information and to the others welcome we hope you learn a little bit more about a bio blitz after this all right so what is a bio blitz a bio blitz is defined as a bio blitz is a community science effort to record as many species as possible within a designated location and time period. Um, so a BioBlitz is a great way to get outside and learn more about the environment that you live in. You typically participate with a large group of people, which can be a lot of fun. Um, you can see what other participants are finding in their neighborhood and they can see what you found. And since a BioBlitz is designed to focus on a specific geographic area and time period, it kind of acts as like a snapshot of the biodiversity in your area, which is really cool. Some other great aspects of a BioBlitz are that it builds community connections with nature. Um, you can potentially discover rare or endangered species. You're helping to preserve unique and valuable habitats. You gain a better understanding of biodiversity you get the chance to identify invasive species and gain a better understanding of long-term changes. So we couldn't do this whole BioBlitz without our partnership. Um, we have this partnership between CTUC, uh, Long Island Sound Study, New York Sea Grant, Peconic Estuary Partnership, South Shore Estuary Reserve, and the Long Island Invasive Species Management Area. Um, so last year we had a great turnout. So thank you to everyone who made the event such a big success. Um, here we have some of the results from last year, which includes more than 60 observers, over 2,800 observations, over 900 species observed, and the most common were common milkweed, poison ivy, great egret, and a gray catbird. So very cool results. And now I'm going to pass it off to Emily Hall. She is a conservation policy advocate also of CTUC, and she will talk about all of the different habitats included in this coastal bioblitz and the various species you might find there. Thank you so much, Ariel. Um, so as Ariel mentioned, I'll be going over some of the really cool and unique and valuable habitats we have across Long Island and some of the species that you might be able to find there. Um, but we do want to say, you know, you don't have to look for just these species. The real goal of the BioBlitz um, is to look for all different types of species that you might find. These are just a couple of highlights. 
Um, so first we'll start off with beaches and dunes. So obviously Long Island is well known for its beautiful and diverse variety of beaches. Um, beaches and dunes are basically the transitional sandy or cobble shoreline area between the land and the marine environment. These dynamic systems are in a constant state of erosion and deposition due to tidal action, currents, and wind. Next slide, please. Oh, thank you. So similar to last year, I'll be going over just a few of these species. Um, there's a couple new ones, a couple updates. Um, basically, we'll go over to which ones are native and which ones are invasive. And our LISMA partners will be doing a great overview later of what that exactly means. So I'll save that for them. Uh, first, we'll start with a horseshoe crab. It's a very characteristic species of our beaches. They've been around for over 300 million years and are more closely related to spiders than crabs. Uh, during the late spring and early summer, these crabs travel from deep ocean waters to our coast to breed, and their eggs are a really tremendous food source for coastal birds. We then have the American oyster catcher. The shoreboard is boldly patterned with red and yellow eyes, a red orange bill, a black head and breast, um, brown wings and a white underbelly. They're some of the only birds in the environment that are able to open clams and oysters, hence their name. Uh, we then have the common tern. These are the most widespread terns in North America. They have long, narrow and angular wings with pointed wing tips. Uh, they also have um, kind of slender, uh, bills. The tail is also forked. They have an orange bill tipped with black and a black cap uh, for breeding birds and non-breeding birds have actually a white forehead. Uh, they forage in groups and nest on the ground in colonies. So then it's the beautiful seaside goldenrod. It's a native perennial plant that produces a tight clump or narrow evergreen leaves with deep yellow flowering heads. It is highly salt tolerant and deer resistant as well. Then we have Tree of Heaven, an invasive species. Uh, this plant is native to China, was introduced to the US in the 1700s as an ornamental plant. The bark is smooth and brownish green with, um, and when young, it eventually turns um, light brown to gray, resembling the skin of a cantaloupe. Uh, it is capable of reaching about 80 feet in height and the flowers are small, yellow, green, and appear in clusters. Next slide, please. Okay, so I'll also highlight um, some of the different um, parks or kind of public spaces where you might be able to find these habitats and these specific species. And many of these different kind of priority sites also have multiple habitats in them. So we'll go over some of those as well. But some we'd like to highlight include Robert Moses, Wellwind Preserve County Park, Northwest Harbor County Park, West Meadow Beach and Jones Beach State Park. And I should also say, that we tried to pick a variety of sites within the different um, estuary programs. So within dif the different estuary areas. So SSCR stands for the South Shore Estuary Reserve, which is kind of all encompassing of like the Great South Bay area. Then there's a Long Island Sound Study, which is obviously like the North Shore, New York City, Westchester area. Um, and then Peconic Estuary Partnership, which is pretty much all of Peconic Bay area. Uh, next slide, please. All right, so then we'll move on to salt marshes. Salt marshes are our coastal wetlands that are flooded and drained by salt water brought in by tides. The soil of a salt marsh is composed of deep mud um, and peat, which is decomposing plant matter. They also serve as a nursery habitat for young marine life and protect the coast from erosion and strong storms by creating a buffer against powerful waves. Next, please. So some of the species you might find here are the common reed. You may have also heard this referred to as Phragmites or Frag. It's a very aggressive perennial plant that outcompetes native plants and displaces native animals. It can reach 15 feet in height and is often found in dense stands. The leaves are blue green to yellow green and in late July to August. Um, they appear to have purple to gold, highly branched flowers and the seeds will then appear grayish and fluffy later in the season. We also have our very neat and kind of charismatically looking diamondback terrapin. Uh, it's the only turtle that had its coastal marshes with brackish water, which is a mix of salt and fresh water. The carapace or shell has multiple diamond shaped rings and their skin can range in color from dark gray to white with black irregular spots. And although their primary really habitat is in the marsh, they can also be found nesting on some sandy um, areas and beaches. 
We then have a new one um, added this year to the invasive species mix, the Asian shore crab. It was first identified in New Jersey in 1988, and basically its range is now between Maine and North Carolina. Um, it is known to crowd out native species in Long Island Sound as well. Um, they can about the size of a silver dollar and their identifiable features are a small hard bubble on the crux of its claws, three spines along each side of its shell, as opposed to the similar looking green crab, which has five um, spines along the sides of its shell, and then a light and dark banding pattern along its legs. We then also have perennial pepperweed. This is another invasive, a weed that was introduced from southeastern Europe and Asia. It grows approximately one to three feet tall, has milky white flowers that form dense round clusters with bright green to green, gray green leaves. They can rapidly form large dense stands that displace other vegetation. And lastly, for our salt marshes, we also have a ribbed mussel, yellow brown to brownish black on the top side um, of the shell with a glossy underside. Uh, they burrow partially in the mud and remain partially exposed, and they are filter feeders, which contribute to both water quality and salt marsh growth. All right, next, please. A couple of the, uh, the sites that we have where you can find the salt marsh habitat include Akabana Harbor, the Marine Nature Study Area, Sunken Meadow State Park, Indian Island County Park, and the JFK Wildlife Sanctuary. Next, please. Okay, so now we have our freshwater wetlands, streams, and ponds, which are often habitats that can be found together or in close proximity. Uh, freshwater wetlands are the transitional zone between the land and freshwater. There are areas where the water table is near or at the surface of the soil and there is no tidal influence. However, many of Long Island streams or ponds are also fed by groundwater um, and influenced by tidal cycles just because of our proximity to the coast. Uh, many of these habitats are also greatly formed and influenced by Long Island's glacial history. Next, please. Okay, so a new species we have for this habitat area, a new invasive, is the Chinese mitten crab. It's a light brown crustacean with a distinct pair of hairy white tipped claws. It's native to East Asia and it was thought to come to the US in ballast water, which is basically um, the water that's in like large cargo ships, or potentially um, there were intentional releases of this species. It also has light brown square, square shaped carapace, um, which can reach a width up to 10 centimeters and features four lateral spines. Males have a V-shaped abdomen while females have a U-shaped abdomen. And the crab's legs are twice as long as the width of its shell. And again, they're just really identifiable by those kind of hairy claws. Uh, next, we have the great blue heron. They are the largest of the North American herons. Um, with, they have long legs and a thick dagger-like bill. They appear blue-gray with a wide black stripe over the eye. We also have Japanese knotweed, which was introduced from the US uh, to the US from Eastern Asia as an ornamental in the late 1800s. It is a shrubby, herbaceous, wood appearing perennial that can reach 10 to 15 feet high. They also have branch like offshoots of small greenish white flowers from August to September. We then have our spotted salamander, um, a visually eye-catching salamander with bluish uh, black or darker brown coloring, two rows of those really characteristic yellow spots. Uh, there are an iconic vernal pool species, which basically means they're reliant on vernal pools, which are temporary seasonal bodies of water to breed. We also have uh, another highlight for a turtle day on the spotted turtle. This polka dot turtle um, has yellow spots on his head, neck, legs, and upper shell with a black background coloration. They're active from March to October and may be seen alone or in groups. Next, please. Okay, some of the sites where you can find some of these kind of wetland streams and ponds including the Cranberry Bog Preserve, South Shore Nature Center, Connectquat River State Park, Emma Rose Elliston Memorial Park and Halleck State Park Preserve. Next, we have coastal grasslands. Coastal grasslands are an opal, open glacial outwash plains dominated by tall grasses, such as little blue stem and switchgrass. They often have diverse wildflower communities as well. Next, please. 
Some of the species you might find in these types of habitats include the black-eyed Susan, which is native to North America and a popular wildflower. It attracts butterflies, bees, and a variety of pollinators. The plants bloom from June to October. They have brightly colored flowers with shades of lemon, yellow, orange, and gold. We also have the invasive black locust, such a tree that while native to some parts of the country is invasive to others. Um, it was planted outside of its native range for hardwood lumber, erosion control, and nectar for honey. Um, it basically can, will bloom through May and June. It produces drooping clusters of these fragrant white flowers. We also have the invasive mile a minute. It's a vine that can smother other plants by growing over them. It grows up to six inches per day. It's native to India and Eastern Asia and was accidentally introduced via contaminated seed. It has this unique uh, leaf shape, as you can see, with barbs in the stem and underside of the leaf, small white flowers in early summer, and spikes of pea-sized blue fruit in July. We also have the invasive mugwort, native to Europe and Eastern Asia, where it's used as medicinal herb. The shoots emerge. Uh, during the spring and flowering occurs from July to late September. Adult stems are long with numerous branches towards the upper part of the plant. We also have the beautiful uh, New England aster with colorful flowers and deep violet to lavender pink coloring. They can grow up to six feet high and provide critical, um, a critical source of fall nectar for pollinators, especially uh, monarchs as they stock up for their fall migration. Next, please. Okay, so one of the um, kind of best areas we have for this are Comset um, State Historic Park. Um, and although there's not a large kind of amount and expanse of grasslands on Long Island, a lot of those species I just mentioned can also be found kind of around your neighborhood or even in your yard. So even if you're just going out kind of around your local neighborhood to do the bio blitz, you might see some of those. Next, please. All right, so coastal and inland forests. Coastal and inland forests around Long Island are heavily influenced by our moderate uh, coastal climate. Um, they also have the structural complexity with multiple vegetation layers. Next. Some of the species you might find here include the bald eagle, and these definitely have um, had a comeback on Long Island, which is exciting. Um, obviously, they have their characteristic white heads with dark brown bodies. They eat mostly fish, which is one of the reasons you can find them near lakes, reservoirs, rivers, marshes, and coasts. Uh, next again, we have that invasive black locust, um, which similar to before, it's native in some parts of the country, but not to others. And it was introduced for lumber and other items and has those kind of characteristic fragrant white clustered flowers. Uh, we also have garlic mustard, originally from Europe and Asia, and it's become a very troublesome invasive. It was introduced in North America in the mid 1800s for herbal medicinal qualities, but it blocks native plant sunlight and outcompetes them for moisture. Uh, so their first year leaves are rounder and take a roseate formation, and then their second year they grow up um, a stem and basically have a more triangular formation um, in heart with like kind of a heart shaped uh, with tooth edges. They're small white flowers um, up kind of in the springtime. All right. So the multiflora rose, it's also an invasive native to China, Japan, and Korea. It was introduced in the late 1800s. It was used in the horticultural industry. It is a climbing shrub with white flowers that appear from May through June and are grouped or clustered. And unfortunately, we have another kind of new invasive to highlight the spotted lantern fly. It's an invasive pest from Asia that primarily feeds on the tree of heaven, which we mentioned before, but can also feed on a wide variety of other plants, such as grapevine, hops, maple, walnut, fruit trees, and others. Um, the basically it could really impact New York's forests as well as the agriculture and tourism industries. It was first discovered in Pennsylvania in 2014 and has since been found in New Jersey, Delaware, Maryland, Virginia, um, and New York. Adults begin to appear in July and are approximately one inch long and half inch wide at rest with these really bright eye catching wings. Their fore wings are grayish with black spots. The lower portions of their hind wings are red with black spots and the upper portion are dark with those kind of white stripes. All right, next, please. So then some of the spots where you might find some of these species include Wertheim National Wildlife Refuge, Hexer State Park, Alley Pond Park, um, Ashmomic Preserve, and um, Mishomic Preserve as well. Okay, so Ariel, if you wanna hop in with our next poll. Yes, so our next poll wants you, uh, wants you to tell us how familiar you're with 
the iNaturalist platform. So I'm going to launch that poll now. So whether you're very familiar, you've maybe just heard of the platform or you've never used it. I'll give you guys a few seconds to put in your answers. All right, it looks like most people are very familiar um, or have heard of the platform. So that's great. And if you haven't used the platform before, you're in luck because we're gonna go through all of the logistics on how to use it. All right. So next we're going to hand it over to the Lisma folks who are going to talk about some invasive species. Um, and how to use that iNaturalist app. Thank you. I'm Bill Jacobs with the Long Island Invasive Species Management Area. Uh, LISMA is a voluntary association of land managers and land owners working together to prevent the spread of invasive species. This bio blitz is part of the New York Invasive Species Awareness Week, which occurs around June 6th to June 12th. And the Invasive Species Awareness Week, uh, we have this event to promote knowledge and understanding of invasive species and the harm they can cause. So th this bio blitz is critically important to gathering information about new and emerging invasive species that may be out there. So what is an invasive species? We covered this a little bit. We can think of species three different ways. Native species are those that uh, developed or evolved in a particular place over hundreds or over thousands of years with all the other plants and animals that are around them. Then we have non-native species. These are species that are introduced, usually introduced by people to a new place, to a new ecosystem where they were not previously found. Most species of plants and animals that have been introduced, most non-native species are not harmful at all. Many of them are even beneficial, such as, uh, for example, broccoli. It's not a native species, but it's very beneficial. Then we have invasive species. So these are also non-native, and they've been introduced by people either accidentally or intentionally to a new ecosystem. And these species cause harm to the environment, the economy, or to human health. So here are some examples, giant hogweed. It's a huge plant, can grow about 15 feet tall. It has a sap that can uh, uh, burn the skin if it's exposed to sunlight, se severely burn the skin. So DEC and other partners have been working on controlling that on Long Island and have been doing a good job with that. We have the emerald ash borer, which damages ash trees. And then there's also fish like this northern snakehead that gets into local ponds and waterways and competes with the native fish. So what these species do is they crowd out and displace native species. Early detection is very important. Again, that's a reason we like to do the bio blitz. And one of the systems that we check, one of the databases that we at LISMA check frequently, almost daily is iNaturalist. So the data that you collect about all the species you see out there are used by professional conservationists, including invasive species people. So iNaturalist, it's an online social network with people sharing biodiversity information to help each other learn about nature. And using your cell phone, you can identify and record any plant or animal that you see. And over a period of time, over years, you can uh, keep track with the photos of all the plants and animals you've recorded. Kind of neat. And Abby is going to demonstrate it. These are, this is a number of observations that have been made using iNaturalist so far, more than 99 million. 
Thanks, Bill. Yeah, you can start with playing that video. Can folks hear it? I'm not sure, I'm not sure that it. your audio is shared. Oh, okay. Hang on a sec. That's, let's see. Oh, I'm sorry. Let's see. How do I share the audio? You might need to stop screen sharing and then um, there's a checkbox when you start screen sharing again. Okay. Thank you. Sorry, folks. I could also try if you want. Yeah. It seems like it just popped up that you are sharing your computer sound. So if you share okay, your let's screen try now, that maybe then. it'll yeah, maybe it'll come through. Let's let's try again. Abby, do you want to try yours? Now sure. I'm sharing and I can't see anything. Sorry about that. No problem. Okay. So you've installed the iNaturalist app and created an account. Time to get outside and record your first observation. Here's how to do it. Any living thing, like a plant, animal, or fungus, can be an observation on iNaturalist. Once you find something you'd like to record, just tap Observe and take a photo. You can review your picture, then hit Next if it looks good. To identify it, hit what did you see? If you have an internet connection, iNaturalist will suggest 10 visually similar species and often a common ancestor. You can choose one of those or search for a species name. On this observation detail screen, you can add more photos of the same organism or write a note. The date, time, and location have been automatically added. You can also change the geo-privacy of the observation, mark whether it's captive or cultivated, or add it to a project. Once you're finished, just hit share and your observation will be uploaded for everyone to see and identify. That's it. Keep on exploring and sharing. Great, so that's just a quick overview of um, making an observation. Ooh. <laughs> But I will go through um, a, little, a little bit more slowly, uh, particularly things like the iNaturalist website. So we'll start there. Um, so here's where you can see iNaturalist on your desktop. Here you can um, add observations and join projects. You could also do that on your mobile phone. So you have two options. Um, you can hit sign up here and uh, it's totally free, will always be free. Email, username, password, all good stuff. I'm gonna log in because I already have an account. And the first thing you should do when you log in is look up um, LI Coastal File Blitz 2022. It's important to include the 2022, otherwise you'll be directed to last year's project, which is that one, not the blue one, you're looking for the white one. Um, and in the corner right here, instead of leave, it will say join. So you just click that and you have joined the Bio Blitz. That's pretty much 99% of the work you need to do. Um, so it, what it means is that um, now that you've joined the project, any observation that you make within the week here um, in these areas, also depicted in this map here, 
will automatically be added to this map. So you see observations um, all over the island from uh, what you what you found that week. You could also check back on this page if you want to see what others have posted. If you're really good at identifying species, you can help others identify it. Um, you can even post a little journal entry if you want to talk about a particular fun adventure that you had where uh, while you were bio blitzing. Abby, oh, yep. excuse me. You have a little gray box on your screen. I don't know if others can see it. It's huh. probably a Zoom artifact of some sort. Is it smaller now? Drag, it got smaller. If you can drag it off to the side or something. Maybe there. It went away. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, it was in my way. I didn't know it was in your way. Um, thanks. So this is the project page. Again, hit the join button. Um, mm -hmm. So um, you could also use the search bar to search for a particular species. So if you're interested in salt cedar, that's some, one species that we're interested in lately, um, you can type in any kind of species. There's a lot of different ones that'll come up. Um, but you can view observations of it. So say you wanted, maybe you're looking for one particular kind of plant or animal. Um, iNaturalist will be able to help you with that for sure. And um, you can click around to see where others have reported it. I'll click on one observation just to show what an observation looks like once it's up here. It includes the photos that this person has taken. Um, it includes its location, the day it was observed, and also interesting to point out, um, iNaturalist technology will give you a suggestion of the species that you have observed, which you saw in that video, um, or others can also help you identify it. So my colleague Kaylee, which you'll hear from in a second, um, agreed that it was a kind of salt cedar. And when enough um, people agree about it, it can actually become a research grade observation. We use those a lot to be able to um, see where invasive species are spreading on the island and also get early detection records of them before they uh, spread very far. So that is great. That's for searching a species. You could also just search for a particular location. So say you're going to Jones Beach State Park and want to see maybe some species that are there uh, before you head out. You can type it in, look for observation and see there's a lot of different species here, a lot of different observations and yield up yours will be joining those. You can scroll through here to see it um, by day. And you could also just get a more broad overview of the kind of species that you might encounter there. So worthwhile. Lastly, um, on this website side, you could also upload an observation on here. So um, say you didn't have very good service while you were in the field, or you just prefer to do things on a computer, you can easily do that on the website. Um, picking a file to upload and entering information about it, similar to um, what I'll show you in a second on the phone, in the species name, the date that it was observed, other notes, and Haley will walk through um, things about uh, whether it's captive or cultivated. Your project will, again, will automatically be on there. And when you're done, uh, also enter some notes if you want, you can submit it. So that's it for. Um, the website side of things. I'll also now show uh, quickly the phone app. I'll start sharing on my phone. Nope, that's Seek, that's not iNaturalist. Okay. I. Am I sharing my screen? Not yet. I'm not. OK, that didn't work. Share content. You're on. Are you on Zoom on your phone? I am. Did you uh, let's see. did you call uh, I it? didn't hit start broadcast. Now it should. OK. There you go. Yeah. It's happening. Good. It's happening. <laughs> yes, great. Now I can see it. OK, so um, first I'll go to projects. And oh, I think we see, see you, we see that picture. little box again. There we go. OK, get rid of me. <laughs> first, we'll go to projects. Um, and here you can see um, once you've joined the project, it'll appear here, or you could search for it again. Um, another way to view it on the phone. You could see another quick way to see the species that have been observed, the observers, and like. 
So that would be in your lower right corner on an iPhone. Might be a little bit different on an Android. You, the best part, I think, is making an observation. So again, you can choose between taking a picture, um, uploading a photo you've already taken, recording sound, but we'll do uh, taking a picture. So I'll do my plant right here. Better to do a plant that's like out in the wild, but for demonstration purposes. <laughs> um, again, it'll give you a suggestion on what it thinks you see. Does it say it's confident, not confident enough to make a recommendation, but um, it's still useful to put something uh, because that helps others to be able to identify it. So I know that this is a spider plant. Um, I can type that in myself or use their um, recommendation. So I'm just gonna, I'll put that for now. I'm not gonna upload this right now. Um, again, it will automatically be included in the project. You can add notes to it, which is very useful. And um, your location is automatically recorded. So very easy um, and include multiple pictures, multiple angles. It's good to include things like flowers. Um, again, it doesn't need to be just plants. iNaturalist is for anything. So anything you think that is interesting um, that others can be uh, used to identify it is great. Now, um, if you wanna see a record of your observations, you can go through to me and um, see your own records. Lastly, uh, like on the website, you can use the map to explore observations that are around you. Um, and there's more refined ways to search things too, for a particular species, a particular location, or even just um, by image. So iNaturalist is so powerful. There's so many cool things you could do with it and definitely recommend checking it out. Abby, did you show how to join the, the BioBlitz? Yeah, so I could show how to do that on the phone as well. Mm -hmm. um, you just type in again, LI Coastal BioBlitz. And you want to hit the one that says 2022. And instead of saying leave there, it will say join. Uh, I've already joined, so it says leave. <laughs> so this way, everything you observe will be recorded in this project, the Long Island Coastal BioBlitz project, when you join that. Yes. Thanks. You're welcome. And that's it for me. Thanks for that, Abby. That was really great. I think, are we pulling back up the slides? Um, or if not, I can pull them up for Lizma. I have um, the latest updated slides, but do you guys okay. have? Okay. No, yeah, go for it. Definitely pull those up. Bill's got it. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Yeah, so thank, that was great, Abby. It's always fun to run through and remember different parts of iNatural. So always great if you upload observations online. Um, but yeah, you can go ahead and go forward. And I'm gonna, uh, and you, yeah, you can keep going forward. Um, oh, yep. And again, <laughs> sorry, we're going to the. Uh, so this is how you would join on the desktop yeah. version. You would hit the join there. It's another way to join the project. Great. So I'm going to talk to you guys a bit about how to take some uh, photos that are fit for an ID on iNaturalist. So these were some photos I found on iNaturalist actually that I thought were um, that were actually, they were all unidentified species. And for various reasons we were gonna talk about, um, it probably was pretty difficult for people to figure out maybe what the species is. A lot of the images are out of focus. It's hard to tell maybe what uh, the observer is looking at here. Um, and as well, you know, there, aren't, there weren't many angles, different angles of the photos here. So I know it can be really hard to maybe take a good photo. You're trying to get a lot of them. You wanna, you're outside, it might be hot, but if you really wanna get your, uh, picture identified, your organism identified, and to really help us out, um, just taking a minute to really take some great photos is going to be super helpful. And I know sometimes I've definitely uploaded some pretty terrible looking photos too, but I think we're all going to work together to take some really great photos this this upcoming BioBlitz. Um, and the app lets you change your photo. You can take a picture and it asks you, is this one okay? And if you don't like it, just hit no and take another one. For sure, you can always change it. And again, the algorithm on iNaturalist, it's really great and it will probably give you a pretty close identification of what something might be. 
Um, but it really does still rely on actual real people to confirm that identification and make it research grade. Um, so remember that there are real eyes looking at these things and trying to help you to get, get it down to a species at best. So yeah, we can go forward. So we wanna to remember to really focus in and isolate the species in question, really trying to use the focus feature on your camera. Um, maybe you're using just like a real camera, a real point and shoot camera, or maybe you're using your phone camera, practicing that ahead of time to get those good photos. Um, and then again, isolating that species. So maybe using your hand or a finger, or maybe you have a set of keys that's a pretty standard size. Maybe you have a ruler, which is really cool. Maybe just carry around a ruler um, and you can compare that and give someone a pretty good idea of how big a leaf might be or how big a flower or the shell of a hermit crab might be. Um, yeah, different things like that to really isolate that photo. Somebody used a coin, which I think is really cool. They also, to isolate that um, species, they, I thought it was cool that they use a little white, it looks like some sort of white lid. I know sometimes when we go out, we'll use white takeout containers. Um, which are pretty inexpensive to just throw in your car and have with you um, to maybe take a aquatic plant out of the water and place it in your little, you know, little your little shallow bucket that you have there. And it can really help since some aquatic plants, when you take them out of the water, they might look a lot different. They might lose all of their shape and go limp and look really weird and uncharacteristic. So it can be really helpful as well for creatures like hermit crabs. They might not want to come out of their shell when they're you know, when you pull them up out of the water, of course, carefully. Um, so having these little buckets to really isolate them and maybe help them to be kind of calm and come out of their shell. Um, something else that's really helpful is taking a lot of photos. iNaturalist gives you the ability, ability to take a handful of photos. I think it's up, up to four. Um, this person somehow has more, I, I guess, online. If you upload them on the online platform, maybe you can upload more. Um, so oh, you can go back. So um, yeah, so maybe taking a lot of different angles um, for especially things like mushrooms, you wanna see the gills, you wanna see the stipe, the stem, the, you know, the cap, the, the different colors that it might have on all the different parts. Um, and same goes for plants and flowers and bugs. You wanna, we wanna see different angles to maybe get a better shot or to get a good idea of what the species is. Um, so all those things can really help. Again, like you know, we wanna see the flower color, the leaf veination, if there's hairs, you know, get close, get far away to see maybe like a general picture if there's a lot of the species there. And as well, you can utilize the note box. Notes can be really helpful. Maybe you saw a particular mushroom growing near a tree that you know is an oak tree. Um, a lot of species oftentimes uh, want to grow together, they wanna to live together. There's a lot of different symbioses happening in nature. So to play on that, that can really help someone to identify a species in question. So you can go ahead and go forward. And yeah, utilizing different features on an actualist, like is the species wild or naturalized? Is it captive or cultivated, um, as Abby pointed out? So maybe you're outside and you see something like the salt cedar, which is an invasive plant, but you know that it's growing in somebody's yard and it's not spreading everywhere. Um, and you can say, this is a captive and cultivated species, it's not spreading versus if you're seeing it in the wild on a shoreline. Um, that can really help us on our end to maybe go out and understand, oh, is this a species that's spreading everywhere? Or are we gonna get to a site and realize it's just somebody's backyard? <laughs> so these are really important features to use and they're really quick to just check. All right, some BioBlitz best practices. We wanna be safe, be respectful and have fun. So remember, we're gonna be safe, we're gonna pack the essentials. If you're gonna go out for maybe a long hike, make sure you have water. I know it's like silly to say, but I, I'm i the biggest offender of this. I will be out and I won't have my water and Abby will be like, Haley, are you kidding me? You don't have your water. Um, bring a water bag if you want. They're really great hydration packs. Um, remember to wear sunscreen and bug spray, whether it's, you know, making sure that you tick treated your clothes or you just have some, you know, some off bug spray with you because the mosquitoes might be pretty bad. I know when me and Abby did the bio blitz week, we ran into a, a site that was had tons of mosquitoes. So I know it's been a long winter, but mosquitoes are still a thing. All right, you can go ahead. Yeah, and remember, we wanna be safe. We don't wanna be touching any plants that we maybe off the bat don't recognize. So if you see a plant um, that maybe has three leaves and you're not sure, you have iNaturalist with you, check to see, make sure it's not poison ivy. Um, oftentimes poison ivy, we see it growing on the ground. It has those three, you know, those three leaves that are sort of irregular, they grow like an isosceles triangle, they're kind of glossy, um, and they look like a cute little herbaceous plant. But I mean, I've seen poison ivy up to my eyes before. So it can grow like a nice big shrub. Sometimes it's vining up along a tree. 
Um, oftentimes we might not even see the leaves, but we might just see this really hairy vine. Um, so, you know, really try to make sure we're not touching things that might cause us any sort of harm or pain. Um, yeah. Also ticks, there's plenty of ticks on Long Island. There's plenty of different types. Um, and we wanna make sure after a long day in the field, you're heading home, you're checking all the warm spots for ticks, you know, under your armpits, your belt line, anything that's warm and moist that a tick might like to make a little feast out of. So um, something that's really helpful, oh, I was just gonna say something that's helpful if you're going out in the park, make sure you wear long pants. I know it might be a little warm, but long pants with socks over your pants is a really great tip to, to keep in mind. And check um, yourselves frequently and check yourself carefully when you go home too. As, yeah. Oh, and another pro tip, you can bring a lint roller with you to throw in your backpack or throw in your car if you run through a tick nest. Um, it can be a lifesaver just to roll all of those ticks off of you or a kid or a pet um, instead of going home miserable and pulling them off later. <laughs> Next. Yeah. And we want to be respectful of parks and property. Make sure you check out the rules of a park you're at and making sure it's a park that you're allowed to be in. Make sure that you're not following, going off the trail really far and damaging any of the plants if they're really asking you to stay on the trail. Um, and as well, if not being in the park, you know, at the hours that they're closed. We don't want you as well trespassing on any private property. But if you know someone that has a cool site and they're going to let you into it, that's great. But make sure you get any permission because can't really help you if you get in trouble. Remember to be respectful of nature. We don't want to unnecessarily disturb any plants or animals. Um, if you pick up an animal, do so carefully. Um, if you're, you know, able to and confident in doing that, but otherwise, we really don't want you, you know, messing around with anything. We're trying to respect nature and do so at a distance. As well, it can be really easy to want to get up close and personal with a plant, and sometimes it can be thinking, oh, I'll just pull it out of the ground and have a look at it. But um, remember, if you see a plant, it might, and it's the only one you definitely don't want to pull that one because it could be the last. So do a good job of checking around and making sure there's others before maybe you take a sample back to identify closely later. And lastly, have fun. You enjoy learning about all the different species that you run into, share your posts on social media and be sure to tag all these lovely organizations that we're working with. We'll have all the logos up in a minute um, and check out other participants' observations, help identify things, leave comments and be sure to look at our journal features as well as use the journal feature on your end. And maybe you saw a bunch of things you didn't expect to see outside a bunch of really cool birds and you wanna write a little bit about it and we'll check it out and read it. <laughs> but yeah, and be sure to follow us and stay up to date on all our invasive species updates and other NYSA events. Thanks. Thank you, Haley. Awesome, thank you. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen again. All right, can you guys see that poll? Perfect. Yes. So we have our third and final poll here. Are you willing to travel a little to explore different areas of Long Island? So I'm going to go ahead and launch this poll now. And the answers are sure, or I'd prefer to stay around my neighborhood. And I'll give you all a few seconds to answer that. But so far, it looks like a lot of people are willing to travel. So that's exciting do a lot of exploring around Long Island. There's plenty of great places to check out. All right, I'm gonna end the poll. It looks like, yeah, about 75% said sure that they would be willing to travel around Long Island. Get out of this poll here. So whether you prefer to stay in the neighborhood or explore areas far from home, there are plenty of sites around Long Island where you can survey for plants and animals. Um, to help BioBlitz participants find sites near them, we put together the Google Earth BioBlitz site map. So this map lists various types of habitats like the ones Emily went through earlier in the presentation. Uh, some sites even have multiple habitats within them. 
So to explain how to use the map and show some of the information it contains, I will navigate to the map now and highlight some sites within each estuary. And just to note, the goal of this map is to act as a helpful guide. Uh, please feel free to explore wherever you would like. Um, we also have the principal Long Island Coastal BioBlitz guide. You can see that in the top left here um, that you can download from CTUC's website as well. It's on the same page as the BioBlitz site map, which I'm about to show you. It has a QR code to the iNaturalist project page, um, habitat type species you might find there, sites within those habitats, uh, some tips and tricks and best practices while participating in the BioBlitz. So I'm gonna flip this here. Let's see. Okay, so what we're going to do is go to CTUC's website, so CTUC.org. Now you're on the main page of CTUC's website, and you're just going to go through the navigation bar to get involved, then head under community science, oops, community science, and under community science projects, all the way at the bottom, you have the Long Island Coastal BioBlitz page. So now we're on the Coastal BioBlitz main page. We have some information about what a BioBlitz is, about what the Long Island Coastal BioBlitz is. This we'll get into in a little bit. We have some great events planned for you all for Invasive Species Awareness Week. And then at the bottom is where all of the resources are going to be. So after this webinar concludes, this spot will be where this new recording will be, uh, will be held. And then the brochure, all of that material, and then the local, um, the LI Coastal BioBlitz site map that I mentioned. So I'm just gonna click this here and Google Earth should automatically start loading. All right. So now you can see on the left, we have a description about what the BioBlitz is, what this map is, um, and, a and a map site key. So as you can see, all of these different points of locations are in different colors. So the blue is denoting Long Island Sound study sites. Um, the sites within the Peconic Estuary Partnership are orange, and the sites that are within the South Shore Estuary Reserve are in yellow. So I'm just going to click some random ones here just to show you what sort of information is held in the pop-up boxes. So for Cedar Beach Park, it says it's a Long Island Sound beach and dune, coastal forest, tidal wetlands. And then below here, you can click the address to um, get directions from wherever you are to the um, Cedar Beach Park. And we'll do one of each. So as you can see below, we have the name of the wildlife refuge. It's a pet beach, salt marsh, freshwater forest. And then you can click the address below for directions. And some of these will have extra information, websites, whether there's a fee that you need to pay to enter the park, what times they're open, um, but it's pretty self-explanatory and it's great useful information. We'll do one more. And Steli Estate. SSER salt marsh, freshwater wetland, coastal forest. And if you needed to click directions, I don't know if that shared outside of my sharing screen, um, but it opens Google Maps and then you just put in your, your address. So that's it for the site map. And if we go back to ctuck.org, under get involved, yeah. coastal bio blitz. You would just click on the brochures to be able to download them. And it's as easy as that. So you would download it to your computer or your phone and you can print it if you'd like.
And those are always going to be housed there. We also have the Coastal BioBlitz project page. We're going to have this presentation there and some iNaturalist tips. So now I'm going to go back to the presentation. And now there, we just have some logistics for you guys for the Coastal BioBlitz this year. So it's going to be held from Saturday, June 4th to Saturday, June 11th. Prizes will be awarded to some of the top observers, but you have to make sure that you join the project page. Um, that's very important. Otherwise, we won't be able to monitor what observations you're making. Um, this webinar is being recorded and all the BioBlitz resources will be available at CTUC's website. And make sure to join the Long Island Coastal BioBlitz Facebook page. Um, you can stay connected with others um, and see what everyone's doing in their, in their neighborhoods. And as I mentioned before, this week we have a really exciting set of events for you to coincide with Invasive Species Awareness Week. So on Saturday, June 4th, we have water chestnut pull at Mill Pond. Sunday, June 5th, we have the Westbrook Frag Fight. Tuesday, June 7th, we have Managing Backyard Invaders and a Scully Estate Bat Walk. Um, at Alley Pond, we have a park cleanup and a movie screening of Uninvited. And then to wrap things up, we have a Swan River Tour. So all of that information, more details and how to register can be found on CTUC's website under that Coastal BioBlitz um, webpage. And lastly, we wanted to mention that if you're interested in other community science events and opportunities on Long Island, CTUC and Peconic Estuary Partnership launched the Wildlife Monitoring Network. So the, the Wildlife Monitoring Network acts as a one-stop shop for community science opportunities near you. So I really encourage you all to check it out and explore all the really cool projects going on around Long Island. So that brings us to the end of our training presentation here. Um, if you have any questions about the BioBlitz, you can reach out to Emily Hall. Her, her contact information is here. I will also be including all of our contact information in the chat as well. So we can go ahead and open the webinar up for Q&A. Thank you so much, Ariel, um, and for Lisma folks as well um, for a great presentation. Um, so just I wanted to note too, we're really excited kind of about this year trying to do some more in person um, in other activities timed with Invasive Species Awareness Week. Um, so like Ariel was saying, you'll see all of those listed on the BioBlitz um, event webpage. And although some of them might have different kind of focuses or elements to them, you can still participate though in the BioBlitz through them. So like if you're going on our Scully Estate Bat Walk, you can still take some pictures and we can still talk about some of those features as well. Um, I did see one question in the Q&A before, just so everyone knows. Um, the question was, do you only have to um, record sightings for the specific sites that we featured? And the answer is no, you're welcome, more than welcome to submit sightings from anywhere across Long Island. We just wanted to highlight some sites that kind of had a mixed variety of habitats um, and potentially some different species um, that we're looking for. Um, however, really please submit observations from anywhere across Long Island in New York City. Um, we'd really love to have them. Um, okay. Any other, I see there's questions about the Facebook page for the event. I actually don't have that yet, um, but I will be getting that up soon. And we will actually be sending a follow-up email to everyone who registered for this webinar um, with all the resources, including this presentation, as well as the Facebook event page, iNaturals event page, everything else you need. Okay, that's a good question. Um, so we also got a question about, can you upload um, sightings without a photo? Um, so like if you saw a bird or something up in a tree, um, but you couldn't necessarily get a picture of it, could you also upload that sighting? So 
Um, yeah, I see Abby nodding her head. So do you want to jump in for that? Yeah, you can upload without a photo. You can just include notes. Um, I think there's also a sound option. If you hear the bird, uh, you can also upload that. Um, yeah. Or I've, I've also seen people try to take pictures uh, on iNaturalist like through their binoculars, which is kind of funny. So if you, if you can line that up correctly, you could try it. <laughs> All right, great. Um, and I do remember we got a question last year about um, kind of, I think it was dead or distressed animals. Um, so as we were mentioning before, kind of just about wildlife safety, kind of just respecting, you know, keeping a respectful distance from animals. However, if you do see anything that uh, looks like it's in distress or potentially not doing well, uh, we do have a lot of resources on the Wildlife Monitoring Network page where you can go for animal rescues or other resources like that, or you can feel free to contact me as well. Um, I'll also put you in touch with the right people um, to kind of help facilitate uh, whether it needs to be a rescue or kind of a pickup or something like that. So please feel free to get in touch with the, about that as well. Any other questions? Any other comments or thoughts from our panelists and partners? Um, I just wanted to mention that I put everyone's contact information into the chat box. I also shared a bunch of uh, BioBlitz training resources, uh, some of the things that we were talking about earlier, so some links there, um, and then also the websites for all of our partners in the chat. So if you guys want to just copy all of that, um, please feel free. But as Emily was saying, you're going to get a follow up email as well with all of that information. That was super helpful. And I think that explained it super well. So great job, guys. Thanks. Thanks, Valerie. Oh, and I should also mention too, I saw Jimena put up, I think in the chat um, about uh, potentially having another event. And I think we, sh uh, we might have some others lined up. So uh, if you don't see kind of event in your area, um, please feel free to keep checking up on the BioBlitz website. We'll keep updating it with most recent events. And I think as Haley was mentioning, you know, stay tuned on all our social media. We're often sharing all the events that are going on that will be going on the during that week that we'll be hosting. Um, so keep tabs on that and you should have all the up-to-date information as well. Awesome. So if there aren't any other questions, um, I guess we can wrap it up. It's 7.05. Um, if you come up with questions in the future after we conclude, please feel free to reach out to any one of us and we'd be happy to help. Um, but I just want to take a moment to thank our panelists. Thank you all for taking the time to help organize this BioBlitz and sharing your knowledge with us tonight. And thank you all for joining us to learn more about this BioBlitz. So hopefully you can join us. It should be a lot of fun. Um, and like I said, if you have any questions, please feel reach out to us. And um, yeah, you'll be supplied with all of the links and resources um, from that follow-up email. So again, thank you all and happy surveying. Thanks everyone. Thanks.